that brings us to the last session of the day, and we kept the best for last, a very exciting topic, which is games versus surveys, and to talk about those, Joe Marks and Laurie Wisse. Did you say that right? Yes, you did. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying until the bitter end. So I'm with a company, Upfront Analytics, and we've developed a new app to gather market research data through playful engagement. So the John Sato from Google had a very interesting statistic earlier today. Mobile is great, but you've only got 26 minutes of free time on average with your mobile device. And you're competing with an awful lot of very cool apps. And you've got to get them to give some of that time to do your survey. His conclusion from that was, we'll keep the survey short and gather the data in small chunks. We would agree with that. But we're ex-Disney Imagineers. We actually think we can compete with all the other activities you've got, games, movies, Facebook, to get some time to gather data. And that's what we're going to show you. So we've developed an app. It's been downloaded. We're still kind of in stealth 75,000 times from Google Play. If you have an Android device, you can download it, and I hope you will. It's being played every day, uh, many of the games in there. And we have a selection of games that offer a varied play experience and also allow us to gather lots of what we're going to show you today is a case study in data that we gathered with a partner, Holland Partners, who worked with us um, on a pilot project. And I'm Lori Bizet. I work at Holland Partners, and we're a brand and communications research agency. So a lot of what we do is primary research uh, in the quantitative space. And obviously, as we all know, and why we're here today is uh, it's going to get harder and harder to engage those respondents in a 20-minute traditional online questionnaire. And so when Joe and Upfront Analytics approached us, with Prize Manor and their, their new technique of gathering this research data, we are very excited and we're really interested in piloting with them on this project. So what's our special sauce? Actually, it's surprisingly old school. Parlor games and board games. You've all played them, and maybe as kids. And if you think about games like charades or draw something, um, Pictionary, Taboo, a lot of the tasks that you're asked to do in those games are exactly the same tasks that we ask you to do when you do surveys or focus groups, except one is a lot of fun and the other is really not so much fun. So while we went out and looked through all the thousands we actually own as a company, 500 board games, we looked at all of the games that are out there and pulled from them those that would be entertaining and good on mobile devices, but that would also allow us to pull high quality market research data while entertaining. So what does a game look like? I'm going to show you one of our games. It's called Name Dropper. And it's inspired by the game Charades. So in that game, one person is the clue giver and is trying to get the, the guesser to guess a particular topic by giving them clues. In Charades, you mime the clues. In our game, you give uh, word clues. So this is a two-person game played on two mobile devices. So you're, you're, you're on a break and you want to play, you pull out are the prize manner on your app, and you're matched up with somebody else somewhere in the world who wants to play at the same time. So I'm going to start the video, and you'll see what the two screens look like when a game is being played. So the clue giver is the player one and has been given the movie topic RoboCop and is trying to get the guesser to guess RoboCop. So she has sent clues. You can't read it. Dramatic, fast-paced, entertaining. The guesser is looking at that and thinking, oh, and then 2028, maybe it's futuristic. They type in minority report, which is a pretty good guess. Not the right one, though. So the clue giver sends some more clues. Crime has a new enemy. That happens to be the tagline of the movie that is used in the trailers. So even though it's a game here and the correct guess goes in there, that's market research data. That person has seen the trailer for the movies and is aware of the tagline. Now the roles switch. This person is now the clue giver. And this topic has nothing to do with market research. It's not about the movies. It's Beyonce. We mix in fun topics with market research topics. In fact, in about an 80-20 mix. 80% 80 of our gameplay is just for fun. Interwoven into that is 20% that does market research. So here this person thinks that Beyonce is famous, A-list, talented, MTV and then Destiny's Child and Jay-Z. I'm reliably told those are good clues for Beyonce. I don't read the 
People magazine, and somebody types in Beyonce and they, and they win. And now in the third round, it switches back to another uh, market research topic, American Express. So we are doing a, pro a pilot project on credit cards. And so now, again, what words do this does this person pick? She picks convenient rates and low. Obviously, she has a very positive uh, view of American Express. I don't particularly remember the rates as being low, but, but that's, that's market research for you. So as you can see, this game, which is a very fun game, I hope you'll play, we contrast that with a typical attribute list survey question. And indeed, sometimes when we work with clients, we take their attribute list survey questions and take the attributes and put them as clues into the game. We get the same data. We actually even get data that may be a little bit better because the game has built into it a mechanic that makes people think about words because words have a cost in time and in the points that you can win in the game. So this is an opportunistic game. You play it whenever you want. Um, people play, I think we've played this game. There have been 12 million cl clues given so far. That's our, our McDonald's kind of statistic. It's played whenever you want. Other games have a different rhythm to them. So this game, Slice of Life, is played once per day. We actually want it to be part of people's mornings, morning ritual. Your morning coffee, you play Slice of Life, then you're ready to start the day. This game, you're offered a choice between up to six things. And crucially, they're things you might actually win. So in this case, the choice is a gift certificate to McDonald's versus Subway. In this instance of the game, the choice is a $10 bill or $15 and pennies in a jar. You pick the one you want. You might actually win it. And then in a second step, you move the pie handle around to indicate the proportion that you think the whole population that plays that day will split on this particular topic. So even though I picked McDonald's here, well, actually, I picked McDonald's, and I thought the majority would pick McDonald's, 71.39%. I log in the following day, and if my guess was the most accurate, I win what I picked. So we can use this game to do product comparisons. We can use this game to also get at demographic and psychographic data. So for example, how do you, val how do you value your time versus money? One way to ask it is with a survey question, not so much fun. Asking it in this game is a, is a, a, a more entertaining way to do it. So that's an example of two of the games that we have in the suite. Do people like the games? Well, they do. I decided to do something last night before I handed in the slides. I was going to take the three most recent reviews of the game, the ones that were submitted yesterday evening, whether they were good or bad, I was going to put them up there. If you go on Google Play, you can read all the reviews yourself. But these ones, I'll read them out. The prize manner, very addictive. You should download and play, exclamation point for many of them. Great game, four stars. Great game, me and my husband have lots of fun playing this game. It keeps you on your toes. Love it, awesome game, and love the real prizes. These are typical of the ratings we get. People consider this to be an entertaining game and are, are enjoying playing it um, and are happy to tell people. I should add, after the last uh, 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 panel, these, this is on Google Play where people have volunteered their names. We do not ask for names. We do not ask for any personally identifying data. We don't want to know who you are. That's our answer to the, to the privacy issue. Another way of looking at the fun measure uh, is a measure actually from the game industry, because we really feel we're competing with games and other forms of entertainment for people's attention. In the game industry, the mobile game industry, the day one return rate is what people look at. So they download the game on day zero, but most games, 90% of games, never get played again after the initial download. So the 10% is the return rate on day one, and it goes further down over time. Our day one return rate is 40%. After day seven, it goes out to 23%. And what you can't see is actually out three months, we still have 7% of people playing on average 15 minutes a day. So this is the kind of profile that you would associate with a hit game. Um, we're not in the, we're sort of in the games business. We're not in that part of the games business. But we feel uh, this does give us the ability to compete with other games for people's attention. Now, so it's fun. People like the games. I think you could see that. Maybe you'll play yourself. But does it pr provide good data? Yeah, and I think that the big question that obviously comes out of this is, can this be used as a market research tool? And I think really encouragingly, what we've seen from the pilot that we've done is 
the short answer to that is yes. Yes, it definitely can be. And we do know, though, with any new methodology or any new approach to research, obviously there's a, a long and robust amount of validation that has to be done. So this really is just the tip of the iceberg. But with the games that Joe just talked about, we have seen some really strong results in terms of uh, those linking to traditional research questions. So we're very encouraged by what we've seen so far. And I think what's also really encouraging is the fact that through gameplay, uh, in just two minutes of the gameplay, we can actually get at five minutes of survey content. So we're doing it in a much more uh, engaging and fun way for the respondents. A lot of times, most of the time, without them even knowing that they're being involved in a research study, which is really exciting. And we're also doing it by not necessarily asking uh, direct questions, which is the traditional research approach. We can do things much more implicitly and get those uh, more top of mind or more subconscious responses from, from these game players. And so looking into the, the actual validation that we did with Upfront Analytics, um, obviously for validation we need a, a baseline. And so what we did was ask a more traditional research question among these game players, which is at the top of each of these screens that you'll see. And in this particular instance, we're trying to get at this idea of uh, search engine reputation or search engine advocacy. And so we asked the traditional research question of, you know, which of these search engines would you be most likely to recommend? And we had Yahoo, Google, and Bing were our three choices. Then using the gameplay, we used the slice of life game that Joe had just explained. And we actually gave uh, these game players the chance to pick a t-shirt with the, the search engine logo across the chest. And what we found was that there was a really strong alignment with the t-shirt that they actually picked uh, versus the traditional research question of just which of these search engines would you be most likely to recommend. And I don't think surprising to anyone is that Google comes out as, as the clear winner in both of those instances and actually does a little bit stronger uh, in the gameplay. And then again using the slice of life game in just a slightly different way, more of a behavioral way, Again, those same three search engines, but in this instance, we actually told, told the game players that they had the chance to win a $100 prize, in this case was towards electronics. But to win that prize, they had to actually use the search engine that they said they had a preference for, a behavioral um, affinity to. And again, we saw a very strong correlation between those you know, uh, game playing results versus those from the traditional research question, again, that likelihood to recommend. And this is something that we do frequently, is ask the same thing multiple ways. When you've got players who come back day after day, it's not like a one and done survey. You can interact with them over time. So in the examples here that we saw, in fact, there's a remarkable correlation between both the survey question and the slice of life game, mostly because Google is such a dominant brand. But sometimes we get a very interesting difference between the two. We recently did a study where we asked people, would they be willing to donate to a charity? We asked it as a survey question, 40% said they would be willing to donate. We asked it as a slice of life game, do you want cash in your hand or a donation to go to the charity? And it, it went down below 2%, which is actually close to actual behavior. So sometimes you get uh, a lot of insight from asking the same thing in multiple ways and looking at the answers. Sometimes they correlate. And then switching gears slightly, we're now looking at this idea of search engine awareness, or that top of mind awareness of these particular brands. Um, and in this particular instance, uh, we're using that name dropper game that Joe described, where there's two players, one giving clues and one trying to guess what, you know, what the topic is, or in this particular case, what the brand is. And what we found was that you know, when a brand was more top of mind or there was a more distinct brand, they actually were recalled more easily, so they were able to, to guess that answer more quickly. And so we found that this really aligns well with that, that idea of unaided or top of mind awareness, which are the top two questions. You know, the, the typical unaided list, where just list out all the search engines you're aware of, as well as this idea of familiarity. And what was really interesting about this was, again, it's not a directly asked question. It's more of that implicit, what is truly top of mind for those respondents in terms of, of playing this game and what comes out of that. And what we also really liked about the gameplay part of this was uh, obviously for top of mind awareness or any unaided awareness question, we have that added step of having to code open-ended responses, which adds time and adds money to the process. Um, but with this, we're getting it more implicitly. Uh, and it's also already built into another question. We're also collecting the, the attribute data at the same time. And then the final uh, page that we'll have in terms of validation is looking at these search engine attitudes or the imagery or attributes associated with, with 
these search engines. And what we found in this is that there is for the game players an, uh, a tendency to more closely align with the brands what they have the strongest affinity or what they, they know the most about for that brand. So in this particular instance, we don't see necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of the traditional research question and the gameplay question, but we do see the same uh, areas and ideas pop just at different levels. And so overall, I think you know, we were really excited by the re results that we saw uh, in the partnership with Upfront Analytics. We really saw that you know, using gameplay can be uh, fun and interactive and engaging for the respondents, even when there are market research questions built into it. And they can be as engaged as they would be with you know, any game like a Candy Crush, let's say. Um, and then obviously even more encouraging was that these results were validated. We saw that, that the, the data that we were getting out of the gameplay was as useful and as relevant and we could take to our clients as much as anything that we're asking for from a traditional research study and maybe even more so because we are getting to that implicit idea in a lot of cases and not directly asking questions. And so obviously these are just two of the games that are currently on Prize Manor. Joe and his team are working on a lot more, so there is, is much more validation to come, but we're really encouraged by what we see so far and, and excited to partner with them on future endeavors. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Excellent. That was definitely a fun session to end the, uh, the day with, and it would be fun to see. It's like most of the people aren't asking questions because they're playing the game right now. <laughs> and we'll take uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, I want to have that burger, actually. Um, question. Absolutely. So I was curious, I think you mentioned earlier this was just for Android. Um, so what happens when you've lost 50 to 60 percent of the population who's on an iOS device? Because this is cool, but I can't download it. You can't, and, and, and we're, we're sorry about that. We're, <laughs> we're, we've only been uh, around since our, our, the, the app has been available since July. We do intend to port to iPhone, okay. but we have to start with one of them. And Android, the demographics for Android are a whole lot better. iPhone skews wealthy you're probably a wealthy group out there <laughs> relative to the average population. So we will eventually move to iPhone uh, and broaden that. Maybe actually also Microsoft Connect and other things with more than 10% penetration. But if you have to pick one to start with, Android right. has many advantages. It, uh, right, the demographics are a little different. I was, I was curious about that but, and a little disappointed. <laughs> um, I was curious how it compared to your traditional brand tracking study and how you presented those results to your clients? Yeah, and again, we didn't do in a direct alignment to our research study because the, the questions are slightly different than what we ask in our ongoing tracker. And what we wanted to do was come up with techniques where we could truly validate one idea versus another. But again, in terms of the proportions that we saw and the images that were associated, they were very much in line with what we saw come through in the gameplay as well. Great, uh, big round of applause. Oh, questions? Oh, sorry, one more question. What happens when people don't recognize the brand or the, the person that you have in that one game with the associations? So this is in the, in the name dropper game? Yes. So um, there, in the name dropper game, you, you have the option, there are some power-ups in the game. There's, a li there's some subtleties to the game that we didn't have time to explain here that make it a little, a little richer. One of them is power-ups um, which allow you to skip without penalty or to get the first letter of the clue or the length of the clue. We're going to add more to that. So it's pretty much, it's, it's a positive, it's, it's rarely a frustrating game experience where you go, I have no idea what this is and I have nothing else to do. Um, and of course, you can always skip with a penalty. So we've definitely built that in there. One of the things def for a fun experience that cannot be frustrating for the user. So you've got to give them a number of ways out and a number of ways of enjoying it. Um, and, and we haven't had a problem with that. Um, but people do use the power-ups quite, quite liberally, and, and it does add to the game. So the, the question is about system one and system two uh, thinking and how that gets reflected. And I think I, I should have mentioned it in my answer about the survey question and the slice of life. We think that the games actually do a very good job of getting at system one responses, instinctive responses. 
survey questions do a better job maybe of getting at the more considered system two responses. The fact that we can do both and occasionally when there are differences between the two, then be aware of that, that actually gives us more insight. Um, and the more, the more interesting cases is where there are differences. Um, and so games really do give you that ability without wiring yourself up to electrodes and all of the other great things we heard about. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's exactly it. I think it's yeah, a great approach for not having to ask that direct question and really see what is top of mind for these, these game players. So we thought that was you know, a very interesting additional dynamic to it, aside from just the engaging and different way to talk to these people. Any other questions? A wonderful a round of applause for our final speakers. That was good stuff. And uh, even though I am not here uh, representing Microsoft, but I'll tell them that uh, the Windows Phone platform is going to get its games app soon. Uh, before we uh, go to the end of the ceremony, uh, the, uh, the conference, uh, we do have uh, uh, some uh, a drawing to do for a very fancy uh, soccer shirt. And to do that, Julie Smith on stage, please. All right, thanks everyone. I'll be very quick here. Um, I thought about stacking the deck to um, reward those of you who stuck around for this lovely uh, USA soccer jersey. But I will do my best. I'm going to pull a couple and see, uh, see who's here. Uh, all right, so I'll dig in here. Um, Nancy Luna from Kraft. No? OK, all right. Um, Ah, I know Zoe's here. <laughs> Zoe from Added Value. We'd love to have you come take the jersey. <laughs> yeah. And thanks to all of you who stopped by our booth at Lumi. Have a great night, guys. I'll just come down. Oh, should we do a picture? All right. Come. <laughs> hey, Andrew, a picture here. We'll do, we'll do a we'll do a proper. <laughs> thanks, Jen. I'm sure that was lovely. All right. Thanks, guys. And also, uh, if you make sure to fill in your evaluations and hand them in before you leave, uh, you will also be able to uh, participate in a drawing for tickets for the next conference. And so please uh, make sure to do that. And as uh, the day's proceedings uh, come to an end, as uh, the conference comes to an end, I really have to thank you all for being an awesome audience. And obviously to John's and his uh, colleagues and the Merlin Institute and all the sponsors for giving me the opportunity uh, to be in front of you and to share my thoughts and uh, literally to be part of this awesome event and also to learn so much from all of you, not just from the speakers, but from the participants and how far we have come as an industry, how far you all have come as an industry in the six years or so, eight years or so that I've been speaking at events uh, related to market research is amazing and heartwarming. And I look forward to this sense of innovation, this sense of excitement, this sense of ability to be able to change the world, not simply by the way we run our own business, the way we run our own relationships with our clients, but to look at market research, not as something that's just a service that some clients use as just another part of the mix, but to see what you do, what we all do, as something that can actually help not just keep the existing businesses of our clients going but to help them see new ways and new markets and new opportunities, things that they have not thought of, but that opportunities that exist or can be created because you have been able to find that gem of insight in those mountains of data because you know exactly how to get to that gold and that nobody else can do better than all of you in this room. And I thank you for sharing some of those wisdoms with us. I thank you for being at this conference. Bye-bye. Wow, that's a tough act to follow. It's actually a tough act to follow most of our speakers. So first of all, again, thank you very much, Imran, for sharing today and guiding us through. Um, my thanks, of course, goes out to all of you, especially those brave few that have stayed on until the very end. So thanks for joining us. Um, I think put your hands together for the speakers of the last two days that have done an excellent job. 
and there's, there's uh, about 40 people that still haven't had enough and will come to the uh, MMRA workshop tomorrow morning as well. And Mark has told me there's a few free seats available still in the room. So those of you that really want to go into the hands-on stuff and want to really learn how things is done, have a look at different technologies, different mobile solutions, um, feel, free to just, bloop, bloop, feel free to join us at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning in the alcove room, which is just downstairs. MRMW will be in Europe from the 23rd and 26th of September, so if you need to justify a trip to Berlin, that's a really good excuse. And we're also in South Africa for the first time this year um, on the 4th, uh, 4th to 6th of November. So again, Cape Town is a beautiful city and it's probably worth the trip. Um, hopefully also to learn something new about the African mobile market and market research um, done on that continent. So with that, Thank you all very much again. Please share your feedback forms and you might win a ticket for 2015. And I hope all of those that don't win a ticket, I'll still see you back next year. Thanks again.